and welcome to another episode of Showmakers. This week we have Mike Hurley, a serial podcaster and a recent YouTuber. Thanks for being on the show, Mike. Oh, it's a pleasure, guys. Thank you so much for having me. The very, the very first thing we want to know is, I, I, I told Brian earlier that I have a really hard time describing like what my job is. And in fact, just yes, just yesterday, I had to go to the Chinese consulate to get a visa, a business visa for a secret, maybe podcast, uh, maybe project that might work out. And they asked me like, "So, what's your job?" And I didn't really know how to respond to that. As all, I'm always really bad at describing it to you know someone who's not kind of in the general create YouTube slash creator space. So, like, how do you describe what you do to someone who has no idea? With someone completely outside the space. So I have like a couple of different levels of this, right? Like I start at the top level and keep going until somebody's satisfied enough. So like I'll begin by saying that I own my own business. Right? For some mm-hmm. people, that's enough, right? But then some people want to know more. So say, okay. So have you ever heard of podcasts? And then I, I wait for the blank stare that comes back at me. Um, and I say, okay, so a podcast is basically like a radio show, like a talk radio show on the internet that people can download and that they can have with them at any time on their phone so they can listen on the commute, that kind of thing. And then if people then are interested or they want to know more, I'll say that um, I am an owner of a company uh, co-founded with my business partner called Relay FM. And Relay FM is a te- mostly technology-focused podcast network. We have about 20-some shows and all of those shows either are about technology or are about something that is kind of geeky or nerdy. You know, like we have shows about pens and space um, as well as shows about Apple and Google. Um, and part of my job, as well as being a host on a, on a number of shows um, with running the business, I also run all of the business side and sell all of the ads that we have on those shows. So that's kind of the different facets of my business is that I'm a podcast host, an advertising salesman and a business owner. Yeah, so that so. – we, by our count, you host nine shows. Is that right? Sounds about right, yeah. More or less. So that means that you must be recording almost every day. But w- yeah. And then what, what is like a day for you? What, I know there's probably not a typical day, but what are the different, I guess you, you said sales and then hosting and planning. What goes into the day-to-day of running something like that? So I'm based in the United Kingdom, um, and the majority of people that I work with are based in the U.S. So my day begins with me on my own uh, because I'm awake before everybody else. And what I'll do in that time, I tend to do a lot of the business owner part. So I take care of paperwork, I deal with emails, that kind of stuff. Then as it gets to kind of my lunchtime, which is beginning to for people to start to wake up in America, that's when podcast recording will start. So then the kind of my afternoon, I'll be recording shows, editing shows and posting stuff, you know, and I'm getting shows out there and releasing them to the world. And then kind of late afternoon, early evening, that's when I'm talking to people from the advertising side and working on deals and stuff like that. So we can put so our shows can make money, basically. So my day is kind of broken into these different segments and funnily enough, it just ends up working out to to fit the different segments of the way that I work on my business as well. I'm really sympathetic to the struggle of dealing as as someone who also lives in the UK, despite my accent. I'm really sympathetic to the struggle of basically living on an American schedule over here. I'm literally, just about to say the same thing. It's like I have my normal like nine to five time. I say nine to five. I never get up at night. <laughs> I'm a horrible morning person. Um, like I usually start about 10 and work through till five, but then I end up having like a break for two hours. And then it's like right back to work, just trying to, to catch up with the American side of the business. That is very, that is very normal for me. Like I can sometimes be working up until 1am or something like that. This is pretty much my schedule. Exactly. Yeah. What What, what are your feelings? Cause right now, as I'm sure you know, but most people don't know, we're four hours away from Eastern time because of daylight saving time. What are, what are your opinions on that? I personally hate it. No, I like it. Really? I like it more. Yeah, because I get my work done earlier. I just feel like it's less of a separation. So I feel like, because I love the efficiency of being able to do calls at like 8 p.m. once the day is kind of over. But you can't do that with this. 
Yeah, no, I, I I honestly do prefer it because I get all my recording done earlier in the day. Like, yeah, that wo- it works better for me to be closer. Um, in all honesty, like I do, I do like that because I still get still get the time that I need to get stuff done, but I also get the advantage of the extra finishing an extra hour earlier. I like that a lot. Hmm. Well, let's see, you have five five more days to save for that, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're now. I, yeah, I mean, you're now completely full time as a podcaster yep. and you started that about five, six, maybe seven years ago. Is that right? Yeah, I began podcasting in April 2010. That was when I recorded my first show. And at that point, it was j- just a hobby. Um, and then maybe after a year or two, like I started up different shows to cover like different interests and to work with different interesting people. Um, it started to become more of like, uh, I think I could do this in the future. So I made some moves and, you know, I started my very first podcast network and then I joined with another network and was kind of working on that and honing my craft over the years, um, kind of building up my skills and trying to work out what I would think a business would look like, you know, making a, a little money, but, but not enough money for it to be uh, a career. And then in 2014, uh, we founded Relay FM. And I quit my job after three months um, or something like that. Maybe it was actually a month or two um, after starting the company uh, because things started to go off really well. And that was in, uh, I think it was in late 2014. That's an incredible, incredibly short time for it to kick off and be comfortable with quitting your job. Yeah, I mean, it, on, when you think of it just in pure months, it makes sense. But really, I was just doing the same thing I've been doing for for four or five years, you know, I knew the same people oh, okay, working, yeah. you know, working with the same companies. I'd already built and established relationships with some sponsors. They knew who I were. They knew, they knew my previous work. So it was, I wasn't going in completely cold, right? Like it was, okay, a, yeah. it was a new business, but doing the same thing I'd already been doing. Like for mm-hmm. example, if I had set up my YouTube channel then, and then quit my job after three months to be a YouTuber, that would be a kind of a mind bending experience. But yeah, really, I was, I was just applying it. my craft in a, in a new way, basically. Brian, it seems to make it into every episode that you quit your job with your subscribers. <laughs> I'll just cut it out. Just cut it out. <laughs> That's bold. That is a very bold thing to do. Not not a recommended St- career move. Stupid. Stupid is another word for it. Yeah, that's, and it, it won't work for most people. <laughs> you know, it just won't. Uh, some people talk about, like, I guess they call it, like, the golden years of podcasting, right? Huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where, where I guess some people describe it as all you needed to get a sponsor was a pulse and a couple thousand listens, right? Yeah. But it seems like you kind of started at on the tail end of that. Isn't that right? Um, Relay FM maybe did, but I didn't. You know, I, I had sponsors for shows that had a thousand listeners back in 2011. You know, which is, is something that would be more tricky to do these days. I mean, I would maybe not refer to that as the golden age so much because back then, whilst it was easier to get sponsors for smaller shows, there were less companies interested in, in sponsorship. Where we are right now, whilst it's trickier for a smaller show to make money, if you have an established show, it's easier to find more companies and Things are changing all the time. The business models are changing. You know, we deal less directly with companies now, and, and there are more agencies. You know, companies that that will bring together a bunch of different sponsors, and that has its benefits as well because we're used to dealing with a small selection of people, and we can reach many different companies to 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 work with for sponsorship. So I I wouldn't calling it the golden age would make it sound like today was worse. It's just different. You know, like, really, I would maybe say we're in the golden age now, and that was the silver age, um, because it was waste, It was a simpler time. Because, frankly, where we are right now, there are more people in the world that know what my business is. Like, they know what podcasting is, mm. you know, because of shows like Serial. So we're just, we're in a different world, but it's, it, the one thing that is harder now is somebody starting out, it will take them a lot longer to make, before they can make their first dollar. You know, like, I I mean, I've been working with Squarespace for my entire career. They have been a sponsor on my shows since 2011. They've been an active sponsor on products, projects that I'm working on for that amount of time. 
Um, so, you know, they've been with me when I had shows that are a thousand and then they're with me when I have shows that are 20,000 listeners. It's just been a change really over time over what companies are willing to put their money on because there are more shows now that have big audiences. So they, they work less with smaller shows because they can hit more people with bigger shows, you know? And I think at least from my perspective, like podcasting is kind of, you know, slipping into the mainstream now because there are a lot it of, is. there are a lot of like very traditional type of sponsors that I'm hearing on some of the biggest mm-hmm. uh, shows where, you know, you would never see them, uh, you know, sponsoring like my show on YouTube. Yeah. When, when I started podcasting back in April, 2010, the biggest shows were shows that were focused on technology, you know, technology shows, technology news shows. They were the biggest shows. Now the biggest shows are true crime shows and storytelling shows. You know, they are the biggest ones. Um, or public radio broadcasts that are turned into podcasts or public radio podcasts. Like they are the biggest because the medium is falling more into the mainstream now, which is, you know, it's it's a very different world for us. Um, but it's and and it's interesting to see now, like the top charts and are, are not full of technology shows like they used to be. Um, they're full of shows that are about murder and they're full of shows that are about intrigue and, and stuff like that. It's just a different world. And yeah, we don't have companies like Ford and Coke sponsoring our shows, but those sponsors do exist in the world now. I mean, we're still, even with our biggest shows, we still stay a little bit more focused because our audience is technology minded. So we can still work with more technological sponsors um, for that. But we don't, we don't tend to go on the, some of the bigger brand stuff. Uh, but I find it in, encouraging, honestly, to see these bigger companies coming to the medium because it legitimizes it for everybody else. I want you to imagine a simple scenario. For some unforeseen reason, whether it be your computer being damaged or getting stolen, you lose all your files, all your family photos and pictures from vacations, all those valuable documents from college or work. Imagine the stress knowing that you can never get those back, that they are gone forever. Now imagine the scenario where you chose to back up all your data for just $5 a month with Backblaze. You can download individual files that you desperately need for that upcoming assignment or download all your files again. Or you can even get a hard drive delivered to your home, which you can return and refund when you're finished with it. Backblaze has unlimited storage. That's $5 a month to store all your data. No extra charges, no headaches of deciding what data you need to delete. They even have a mobile app to access files on the go. I love this service and I can't recommend it enough. You can see if you like it without paying a thing by going over to backblaze.com forward slash showmakers for a free 15 day trial. $5 a month to back up all your data is a no brainer. Check them out. What's your, uh, what's your favorite of the kind of mainstream podcasts? Oh, see, this is where you'll, you'll find my break because I, I honestly don't really listen to them. Really? Uh, my tastes have not changed over the years. I mean, I really enjoyed the first season of Serial um, up until the end. I, I wasn't a fan of how it ended. Um, and I never listened to the, the next season. Serial is probably the most mainstream show that I have listened to. Uh, I, I don't listen to anything else. Everything else that I listen to tends to be technology focused or comedy focused. You know, like I listen to, I, I reckon the show that I listen to that has the largest audience is, um, is a comedy focused advice show called My Brother, My Brother and Me, um, which is on a, a network called Maximum Fun, and they just had a TV deal and stuff like that. That's probably the show I listen to, I would expect, that has the largest audience, but it's definitely not mainstream. What kind of numbers are we talking about here in terms of, like when you say a large audience in podcasting, what's it like? Because this is an ecosystem that I'm not all that familiar with myself. I would like, expect that uh, My Brother, My Brother and Me um, has a multiple hundreds of thousands of listeners. That that would be my expectation, mm. just based on shows that I have and kind of the reaction to them and and things that are afforded to them. You know, like you would have to have quite a large audience to get a TV show, right? And and Absolutely. it's it's a it's a TV show on an online online TV network that's owned by NBC, I think, called CISO, but it's still a TV show, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's still a big budget operation. Um, but, you know, even a show like Serial, I, I think Serial is in the uh, probably the high hundreds of thousands to low million, I think, I would expect yeah, okay. in, in, in audience size. Um, but, a, but a successful large podcast is in the six-figure range, I think. That's just such a 
such a contrast to YouTube because, I mean, I'm personally, you know, th- those successful lo- large podcasts are all kind of big network, multi-person operations. Whereas on YouTube, you know, I'm in the high six figures or even low seven figures range for an average. And it's for the most part, just me and some other kind of um, people part time. Yeah. It's well, a, there's a show that I can think of called Law. Law is one run by one guy, Aaron Mankey. And Law has millions of listeners. Like he, he is more, I guess, like it, the YouTuber in that regard, right? Like he is one of, I reckon, one of the most popular podcasts in the world. And it's just him. Like he just had a t- he, he did an actual TV deal. He's doing a show with Amazon, um, working with like the producers of The Walking Dead. And he's just got a book deal. Like that is a one person operation, kind of more like a YouTube channel that has become mammoth, you know? But I know what you mean. Most of the biggest podcasts, like a serial, there's like 10 people, 10, 15 people work on that thing, you know? With 10 people working on a, on a podcast, what, like, I, I'm completely foreign to this because, like, it, this is really a whole new venture for me, which is, like, something we want to talk about. Like, why a YouTuber would get into podcasting and why yourself as a podcaster would go into YouTubing. But, like, 10, 10 people on a podcast seems like, a lot of people like what what are all these people doing is it research and, or editing or like the advertisements and everything like that yeah we'll say something like uh i mean you know i can't talk actual team sizes i don't know how many people work on serial right but i know right, it's a team of right. people and they will have hosts producers researchers and editing assistants and sales assistants right like okay. it's it's a team to put that thing together because it's really high structured i mean so let's say a show like mine you know, shows that I do, there, there is a small team of people. So let's say you have two hosts, uh, you might have an editor, um, and then you maybe will have me who will sell the ads for it. So that could be like three or four people involved in the production end to end of, of one, even one of our most popular shows. Okay. So a lot of, a lot of our audience, um, you know, from YouTube will maybe have heard of you through uh, your podcast with CGP Grey, Cortex. How did how did that come about? Uh, did you approach him, or did he approach you, or uh, me? Uh, Gray lives in London. We both live in London, um, and we became friends just because he he was listening to my some of my shows, and I was a fan of his videos. And we met up in London for lunch, and then we became friends, and we would meet relatively frequently, maybe once a month or so. And then we were at lunch one day, and I said to him we should do a podcast. Like we have a lot of similar in ideas and thoughts in the way that we work. And we have really interesting conversations. It was a lot of just like what, what you hear on Cortex, which is how we get work done. We both find that as a very interesting topic in general, just like how we work and how people work and creating systems for work. And we have a, a lot of overlaps there. And I was learning a lot from him. Um, we were bouncing around ideas together just in general so I suggested it. We thought about it. We extended our lunch that day into dinner and we just kept talking and we worked out an idea. We were pretty proud of it. And then we spent some time honing it into what would become Cortex. Uh, and then we, we kind of committed. We'd do 10 episodes and we'd see how it went. And we did those 10 episodes and we were both really happy. So we continued the show going from there. Yeah, I found it interesting in the first episode of Cortex where you are very optimistic about it going longer than 10 episodes, but Gray is very much, I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was confident I could bring him around to my way of thinking. Hmm. Sounds very, very similar to us. <laughs> <laughs> I think Brian's the more optimistic one. It's just, that's just me in general, though. Because <laughs> officially, officially we're doing a five-episode trial. We'll see what happens. No, he's going to twist your arm, man. You watch out for that guy. Well, you know, we made the mistake of making it all a uh, guest format. And it turns out that it's really hard to get guests. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've done it. I have ran a weekly interview show for something like four years. So I can sympathize with guest booking. Oh, so you've actually stopped it. Yeah, I, I don't do an interview show anymore. I, 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 did, uh, I did like three different shows. Um, you know, kind of like it just rebranded or like refocused over the years. Um, and I had a weekly, you know, I had a guest on every week. Um, and I stopped doing that maybe last year just because 
it was it's a lot of work and having guests on on a weekly basis finding people finding interesting things to talk about with people can be it can be tricky uh, and i decided to kind of focus on my more topic based shows than my interview shows mm. this is not making me more optimistic yeah it's a great <laughs> omen I, there is great fun to be found in it but it's just can be tricky to manage is all i'll say no we're we're seeing that already like we've had great guests so far um but it's we we were hoping this would launch a lot sooner than it was and it's just trying to get people on is a lot more difficult than i expected i imagine it will get easier once we actually launch and we're not just like hey we're two random youtubers that want to start a podcast come on in (laughs) and like most people are just like who are you go away it will get easier once people have seen the show heard the show or can hear the show Mm. it will get easier for you don't worry Mm -hmm. and even then like on youtube we're not all that well known on youtube yet we're kind of upstarts we're both within our first year really maybe a bit more this is part of the youtube and podcast thing that that is so mind-boggling to me right and you were kind of mentioning with how big the teams are so like you know your channels they have like hundreds of thousands of views uh, subscribers your videos have hundreds of thousands if not millions of views but it's like we're not really that well known yet like any any podcast that hits those numbers is very well known in the podcasting industry, right? And and it's it's a very funny thing to me to be like, oh, you know, we're just uh, we're just a couple of nobodies floating around with our five hundred thousand subscribers. Uh, um, it, that is a ve- it's it's a very very different world, and I, I it's one of the things that I've found very interesting as I've moved into like I created my own YouTube channel earlier this year where I kind of just wanted to start poking around to understand it a little bit more myself. I had some videos I'm going to make, some vlog style videos. I'm, I'm, I'm working on trying to do some other types of videos as well. Just It's all kind of me, really. It's, I'm, I'm not really educating or anything like that. It's kind of just like a personality-focused ch- channel, I guess. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's been very interesting to see the way that the differences between all of this stuff and the numbers and the views. And I think some of it's built up in, in money, right? Like the, the money is very different in, in mm-hmm. YouTubing and, and podcasting because typically the money comes from YouTube and the rates are really low. And that's very different to podcasting where the rates are much higher. Um, and just seeing the difference between those things and, and what it takes to be successful, what it takes to be able to do this professionally, the numbers are very, very, very different between YouTube and podcasting. And why do you think the numbers are so different? Because I've seen this myself now that from what I've been told, it's because the conversion rates on podcasts, ads are much higher. People actually go through and become like customers far more often but where youtube people tend to just as soon as the sponsored message starts they cut out and i see that in my own analytics too but do you think there's anything more to it than than that well there there must be a reason that the conversion rates are higher right and my opinion is that they are higher because most of the time the hosts are reading the ads and that changes things significantly and you know we think about this with the ads that we book we only take advertisement from companies we want to take advertisement from. Mm-hmm. So it's already had to hit that first hurdle of like, do we think our listeners may be interested in this product? So, you know, we take what we think we know about our audiences and about the topics and we try and pull up, place advertising that we think would be relevant to them. So that's one part, right? Mm-hmm. The thing with the YouTube stuff is, I mean, they have their algorithm, but it's all kind of just like whatever flows through the door, right? You don't have a say on it. You don't have a say on what you think the right companies would be for your listeners, right? Right. But you're talking you're tr- talking about the the actual Google ads that are shown over the video. Yeah. But or like, even you know even the pre rolls. I mean, and this you know I don't believe that you can say like yes to Ford, no to Coke, right? You, you know you can't make those decisions. I mean, YouTube's right. algorithm tries to make them for you, but there's a there's a certain amount of. Um of decision that you can make in that and it changes i i believe like the the you know the highest of the high um the most popular the most popular do are able to sell more specialized ads and i think you're able to block out certain type of types of ads yeah, categories and stuff right certain categories but I've, yeah I've definitely seen it with that channel um dude perfect they nearly exclusively have toys that are it's not just a random ad shown on top of it. It's like they have bought that space specifically to be shown on top of it. 
and they get part of that, which I find fascinating. Like, I don't know how that works in that part of YouTube. How do you get to that point where you're interacting directly with the advertisers? Well, it's called like the YouTube preferred or something along that lines. It's it's like some sort of program. I I don't want to say too much because I'm not certain about it, but it's it's mm-hmm. a program for the biggest of the big um, to so like let's imagine that that you know that's how that works right like YouTube preferred there's like a di- more direct relationship that is how most podcasting works that's how our network works right of like course, yeah. it's always like that because we're choosing it and our hosts can veto our ads directly if they don't if they don't want a, a company so then also what happens is of a lot of our ads is one we will talk positively about it right because we're happy with it. Uh, we write the copy for the ads. We work with the advertiser. And a lot of them in, include a, a part where our hosts have been sent the product and they talk about their experiences with the product. So it's it's a lot more of a personal relationship with the advertisement to the listener. We're talking about what we like about the product. We're giving our opinions on the product. We're talking about it. And plus, I think there's more of a connection between the listener of mm-hmm. a podcast and the podcast host than there is with a lot of YouTube stuff. Like, especially for you guys, you're not on the screen, right? So like it's, it's, it's they have less of like a, uh, well, like for a lot, you know, like if, if you could take CGB Grey, for example, right? Like it's, there is a personality to them, but there's an obfuscation of it, right? With the, with the YouTube stuff. Right. And I, when, with the podcast, People are getting to know our personalities a lot more because typically it's just a conversation. So Mm -hmm. they're kind of understanding how I am. And and, and one thing that I like to think about, about why people have a link to podcasting quite closely is it's very rare that you'll hear a conversation with people that you're not involved in. You know, something that has a conversation occurring, it's in your ears. You kind of feel like the silent participant to that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You feel involved. And so I think that all of these things, they, they add up to people having a much closer connection to their podcasts. And therefore, when they hear an ad, they're more likely to listen to it and more likely to act on it because there is an implicit trust that what they're being told by the person is true. So we take this into account very strongly and do our absolute best to never mislead our listeners, right? Because we, we know we have that trust from them. So I think this is why it is possible and is done that you can charge a lot more money for a podcast ad than a YouTube ad because there is this connection that isn't there with the advertising that occurs on YouTube. I mean, I know that you can make a lot more money as a YouTuber if you do your own ads in your own videos, right? Mm -hmm. Which was what I I was referring to originally. Yeah. Um, But even then, I think the podcast is, does have a higher conversion rate than I, I'm uh, for me, anyways. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's some of the larger YouTubers that show their face on screen and all that, and have a very close knit like community there. But that's something that they've forged. Like, you need to have that community there before you have that kind of relationship with your audience that I just don't have yet. Um, and I find that really fascinating. Like, how do you forge an authentic relationship and that not to make it like? I'm just doing this because I want to sell you things easier. I think it. I think it comes down to why you're doing it in the first. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think that if the reason that you began making YouTube videos or podcasts or whatever it is is because you wanted to, it was the thing you were passionate about doing. Mm-hmm. I think your intentions are different. You know, if you started it because I want to make money, I think I think it can for some people change the way that they are perceived. Right. For sure. Yeah. And so, like, you know, I, I began podcasting as a hobby and it was just something that I enjoyed. And then over time, started to make money from it. But the real reason that I do what I do, the reason that I started this company was because I wanted to be able to support myself to do the thing that I love. And, and I, I think anyway that this this comes off to the listener um, and they're able to to kind of to feel like what they're doing is and what they're, they're experiencing is somebody who enjoys their work. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that helps build that connection. Yeah. It's it's really interesting. I mean, like I, I, if you hear me talking in person, even at this podcast, I'm sure you notice it, but my voice is vastly less enthusiastic. Yeah. (laughs) And of course, yeah. But part of it is like, I want to get across that passion that I have for the subject I'm talking about and talking in my normal voice is like, yeah, like 
this building is so tall. It's pretty cool. <laughs> like you're not you're not gonna get that passion across. Like and that's part of it, obviously. But hitting that balance and and being authentic about it as well is a difficult thing. You see, it's quite easy to see through people who are being overly enthusiastic, and it's more of an act than it is authentic. This episode of Showmakers was made possible by Fracture. Fracture is a photo decor company that turns your digital images into beautiful gifts or keepsakes by printing any of your images directly onto glass. Once you upload your digital photo and pick your size, they quickly ship your Fracture print out to you, complete with a backing, wall anchor, or stand so they're ready to display right out of the box. Fracture has been nice enough to let us give away one Fracture print every episode. This episode, we're going back to the pet theme, since there was nothing nicer for me than having fresh pet photos in my Twitter notifications after releasing the first episode. All you have to do to enter to win a free Fracture print is tweet me your pet photo at Wendover Pro with the hashtag FractureMyPet. Fracture is also offering all you wonderful listeners of Showmakers 10% off your first order by going to FractureMe.com slash podcast, then make sure to select Showmakers from the one question survey to tell them we sent you. As a reminder, Mother's Day is May 14th in the U.S., and mothers love photos, at least in my experience. So get your mom a fracture print of you two for 10% off at FractureMe.com slash podcast. And so as a successful podcaster, you recently decided to make a foray into YouTube. Why, why did you essentially choose to do that? So podcasting was my hobby when I had a job. And then over time, podcasting became my job and I had no more creative hobbies because all of the stuff that I was doing was contributing to my business. So I didn't have a side project anymore. I've always had side projects. So all of the side projects that I found myself doing or that I thought were doing were just more podcasts about different things. You know, Because I was doing some shows that I knew would never make money, but I wanted to do them because it was something I was interested in. But the process of having the show was still very much like my business. So I didn't feel like I had that side project anymore, which is something that I've always enjoyed doing. It, it helps me focus on my work more if I have this other thing where I can put some other creative energy into. It kind of helps spread me out and stops me from burning out on doing the same thing too often. And as the more I was talking and working with Gray, the more I was starting to pay attention to YouTube the more subscriptions I was starting to have, the more videos I was starting to watch, I was noticing that for me personally, YouTube was becoming a more and more frequent entertainment like avenue in my life. So as I started watching more and consuming more, I started thinking to myself, hmm, I could do something like that. Or I would see something and be like, oh, that's interesting. I would maybe try and do it this way. You know, or I would try and do it that way. Oh, if I was going to make a video about this, what would I do? It started like bouncing around in my brain a lot to the point where I just thought to myself, I'm going to give this a go. And vlogging makes the most sense to me because it's the thing that I think I could produce most easily. And the majority of videos that I've done, have been more vlogging style, me talking to the camera or me showing something that I'm doing in my life, me showing a trip that I'm going on, that kind of thing. Um, and I really, for me, I just wanted to start doing this to learn a new skill, to have a new hobby, and then maybe turn it into a thing one day, you know, continue to hone and build my tone of voice and the types of videos that I want to make and get better and better at it. That if I was able to build a even small in YouTube sense following, it would maybe then be able to help my other side of my business as well. Right. So let's say one day I had 50,000 YouTube subscribers. I'm going to have a section of those people that have never listened to any of my podcasts. So if I got 5,000 more people to go listen to one of my shows, that could be really great. you know. And, and that would be a nice thing for me to continue to build over time, as well as being able to have a hobby. Like I don't ever envision that I would be a YouTuber and not a podcaster. I'm always going to be a podcaster, but who also makes YouTube videos. That's kind of the, the thing for me. It's like my little side project right now. I think we both enjoyed your... I guess the the some of the vlog type videos on your channel a lot because you managed in I think you have 16 or so videos up you managed in those to go to Brian's home country of Ireland where I live now in Scotland and my home or and where I grew up in the DC area 
including the best museum in the world, the Udvar Hazy Aaron's Museum. Fantastic museum. Brian, you have to go there. One of the reasons that I wanted to do vlogging is because I travel quite a lot. Um, I go to conferences and because I work with so many people in the U.S., so many of my best friends live in America. So I, I take a lot of trips out to the U.S. every year. So travel vlogging is something that makes sense to me. Like, like you're going around doing different things. My life during that period of time is more exciting than usual. Like I have stuff that I can show to people. Mm-hmm. So that it seemed like, oh, I could do this. Like, again, like basically for all of April, I'm going to be in like four different places. Over like every week, I'm going on a different trip for different reasons. It's like I have a bunch of stuff I can shoot with that because it's interesting. Um, so travel vlogging and vlogging in general made sense to me as a thing that I felt like I could do because it's also a type of vlogging that I really associate with that I personally really enjoy watching. Casey Neistat is a huge influence on me, mm-hmm. um, and I really enjoy when he shows the trips that he takes. So like for me, it was like that was an obvious thing that I would want to do because I also take some trips that I think are kind of fun and I think people will get a kick out of seeing it. Pretty much every word you just said could have come out of my mouth. It's it's just mine. Yeah, (laughs) I like I'm I think Brian, not not to spoil anything, spoil anything, but I think Brian and I are both casually thinking of creating a vloggy type channel for that same reason, you know, not 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 on like a daily thing, but for travel, because I'm also, you know, in two weeks, I'm leaving and I'm going to be home. I'm going to be like here in Scotland for, I think, two days in the month of April. So it seems like all this travel that I'm starting to do for these, uh, for videos and research on the whole business side could also be really cool videos in and of themselves on a, on a second channel. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see if it happens. Yeah. There's something really fun about like, the voyeuristic nature of watching somebody travel somewhere. Mm-hmm. So like, lots of people <clears throat> like to travel. Not everyone, but lots of people like to travel. But you're never going to get to travel to all of the places in the world. So by watching somebody take that trip, you feel like you get a little bit of the experience. Yeah, it fulfills. It, yeah, it fulfills like part of part of like the desire. Like you know, you just on like a Tuesday night, and you feel like, oh, I really wish I was traveling right now. But you can kind of get part of that experience through watching. You know. I go back and watch old Casey Neistat vlogs all the time from his, yeah, because I, I also like, I was almost like, I was 90% in it for his travel vlogs, 10% for his other vlogs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I just thought to myself, I can do this. Like, I, I take a bunch of trips. I'm going to give this a go. And, and that was what, that was what was really exciting to me. I also really love technology review videos, like really good products reviews from people like MKBHD and Austin Evans and people like that. So that's another thing that like I want to try and do more of, but that's a lot harder. To, <laughs> that's a lot harder than a blog. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. a lot, lot harder. Yeah, you're really like a mini Casey Neistat. <laughs> yeah, because that's what he does yeah, too, yeah. right? I mean, look, Casey Neistat is is the reason that I am doing this. Like, I made my decision to start a vlogging channel when me and my fiance were watching. We watched every Casey Neistat video in order. We just got hooked. And he is a huge influence to me and and somebody that I super respect. I think that he is a very, very interesting person. He has a great story. And, you know, he is my inspiration. He's the reason that I want to make the videos that I make the way that I make them. You know, there are so many people, including me, that are influenced by his style, you know, like the way he shoots, the way he edits. Like it is for me, I'm like, okay. I can see that like that is the base of where I'm building my own tone of voice is from things that I've learned from him, which I think is the way that that people learn these new things. You know, like the way I learn podcasting, the way that I do is by listening to shows from like a network called Twit and then a network called Five by Five. Like they were the the types of shows that I make were based on templates that they created. And, And now I know enough that I make shows in my way. Right. But when I was beginning, I was building from somebody else that yeah but that's really something i've only noticed in my own work recently as well it's like when you realize where who is inspiring you from the start and when you finally found your own voice doing it is a really really cool moment because i only just noticed it the last day because i don't know if you've heard of do you know cold fusion yep one of the kind of techie channels and he was one of the the first channels like hang on i can do this too because I was watching a lot of his videos and I kind of started off trying to emulate his, 
and it wasn't working out so well and kind of moved towards my own style. I find that really cool. But yeah, Casey Neistat is, I, I don't know. Did you watch many vloggers before that? Or was he, do you think he was the first vlogger you watched? He was the first vlogger that I watched with any frequency. Because I felt like he was the first that I watched that I didn't feel like slapping when I watched them. <laughs> like it, it, it didn't, yeah, it didn't feel he was doing it for vain reasons. When I was watching other vloggers, I always felt like they were just documenting their life for attention, whereas he actually put artistic effort into it. But I could be wrong on that. I'm not sure, but that's just my personal feelings. It is. It is a lot of why we, me and my girlfriend, what we were drawn to him was because of his presentation style, right? Mm-hmm. Like. It wasn't just what he was saying, but it was the way that he showed things. Mm. And that that's like a thing for me. It's like I can't I can't make footage look the way that he does, but I take time when I'm making my vlogs to try and find some shots that I think are creatively interesting, mm-hmm. which I don't think I would have necessarily thought of on my own if like I just thought, Oh, I'm gonna make a video diary. I don't think I would have done that, right? So that's like his influence, you know? Yeah. Well, I think before Casey Neistat came along and completely changed like the whole vlogging game, uh, the reason people watch vlogs were like kind of more for the story and to follow it kind of long term. Whereas with Casey Neistat, you could very easily watch one video and be entertained. But also, yep. you know, there's a, you watch like one of his first vlogs when he started out. I can proudly say that I was subscribed to him before the vlogs. Um, Mm -hmm. you you know, when he started out the very first video, the very, um, you know, he was successful. He was uh, definitely successful, um, successful filmmaker, successful YouTuber. I mean, he had a HBO show and everything, but he wasn't that big of a name. And there's a huge difference in style and tone in what he does between, you know, the first vlog and just like a year and a half or two years later on the last vlog. Yeah. But anyway, I, yeah, you can really see his change and his growth. I don't think there's any other YouTuber has, who has had such a such an influence on other YouTubers. I don't think anyone has had more of an influence on other YouTubers than Casey Neistat. I feel like he really legitimized YouTube as a brand in general. Like, I don't think it's just like other YouTubers. I think he did wonders for the YouTube brand. Like that ad at the Oscars alone. Oh like, man, yeah, those those that ad at the Oscars and then the, the one that he just did a couple of weeks ago, like do what do what you can't. I watch those things and I just want to cry. Like <laughs> you're speaking <laughs> to me, Casey. You know, like he he under like I I agree. Like he 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 didn't just make vlogging better. You know, I I think that even people that don't make vlogging channels can can and do learn from him. You know, like you don't have to make videos in his way to take a lesson away from the way that he makes his videos. Right. Mm. You can make a video about anything, but there's, there's stuff that you can pick up from what he does. And, and his, his, his editing, his editing style, you can learn a huge amount from like even like I, I put a, a really short kind of vloggy thing at the end of my my last video. And like there's one edit in there that I pretty much ripped straight from him where he kind of puts the audio over the footage that he cuts over so like the footage starts before the next audio starts yeah so the transition isn't as as awkward like Little just tricks lo- like that yeah it just it does wonders for keeping the the continuity of flowing so you're never like in that awkward kind of like i messed up my lines so here's a new shot <laughs> this episode of showmakers was made possible by squarespace the best way to build and host your website Instead of giving you the same spiel you hear every time, I'm going to tell you my personal top five favorite things about Squarespace since I use them for both my Wendover Productions and Showmaker's website. Number five, they sell their domains with fully upfront pricing, no add-ons or hidden fees. Number four, their templates are truly fantastic. It's pretty much impossible to create a bad-looking website with Squarespace. Number three is a bit of a specific thing but I really appreciate the level of detail they have with their website analytics. It helps you understand who and how people are visiting your website. My number two favorite thing about Squarespace is their support. I've only had to use it once, but they responded quickly, courteously, and helpfully, and they have both a live chat option and an email service that responds 24-7. 
But my number one favorite thing about Squarespace is that they are supporting showmakers and giving you, the listener, 10% off your first order with Squarespace by going to squarespace.com slash showmakers. Make your move to begin your professional web presence with Squarespace over at squarespace.com slash showmakers. One of the first things Brian and I talked about when we were thinking about what guests we want to book is when, when do we try to get Casey Neistat? (laughs) <laughs> how many this how many? is this is the age old question with guest focused podcasts yeah. like you have your list right your your dream list of people and like when do we invite this person yeah that uh, i'll tell you right now it's it's this that is a tricky point to try and think that when you work out you can get there but you should do it but uh wait until you're at least out in the world i think first yeah well i think for me it was mainly Elon Musk and Adam Savage, I think they were at the top of my list now. <laughs> they are some lofty goals, my friends. You have, a, you have a very good dream list. If you know any of them, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> I wished. <laughs> but I mean, when I started doing this, I didn't think I'd be talking to Hank Green and Destin from Smarter Every Day. I mean, like they were my... Like Destin, like I, like if anyone listened, listened to last... Uh, the last episode I think it was pretty evident that I was like interviewing one of my heroes and like that that's pretty cool (laughs) so you can always aim for the next goal yeah I've had that as well like you know I I have the pleasure of working with many of my podcasting heroes now Um, and and it is quite a wonderful thing Uh, and and it does you know it's like give that age-old feeling of anything's possible but I do think that it kind of is if you apply yourself in the right way, you know, like there's, there's nothing stopping anyone really. It's just about what you're willing to do. Absolutely. I I was surprised at how easy YouTube was. Why? You're going to give me, I think you're going to annoy a lot of people who are smashing their heads against their computers, trying to make YouTube work. (laughs) I know. But if you make good videos, you're going to get subscribers and you're going to get, I I, I don't know how, how true that is. Cause I know, Loads of people who make really good v- videos, but they just don't get that many subscribers. They just don't get into that stream of like recommended videos or getting recommended on like Reddit or wherever. I think we, I got very lucky. I, I'll speak for myself, but I don't know what the hell happened for to allow my subscribers to grow so quickly. But I know there's loads of people out there who make great content that don't grow that quickly. And I don't know what causes that. There is some, there's definitely some luck in it, but I'm saying that YouTube, I find YouTube is really good. Uh, There's a lot of flack for there. A lot of people have a lot of different opinions on their algorithm. I think it's really good at finding videos and finding channels that, that captivate audiences. And I found that, you know, I've, I've identified a lot of channels, kind of educational channels, a lot of ones that are still on the smaller side. I first saw them at like, you know, four or 500 subscribers, and now they're up to 50,000. And, and there's a very big difference between the ones I saw and kind of, you know, they're ones that are just not putting the effort into, um, you know, my, my, my biggest tip, whenever someone emails me asking like, oh, how did you do it? How do I make a successful educational channel? Is that the topic of the video is the absolute most important thing above the production quality? Cause, cause they, a video with good production quality but a bad topic will not do well. A video with a good topic and bad production quality, it has a good chance. It, it can do well, um, but a bad topic really prevents a video from doing well. So that's always my my first tip. And so I just there's a very clear difference when I'm looking at smaller smaller channels. There's a very very clear difference in where the channels end up, depending on how well they choose their topics. And I see that difference, and I see that there there is there is merit to the YouTube algorithm, and then there's merit to how it it uh, you know weeds out the ones that are making videos that people want to watch. Mm-hmm. And Mike, that kind of leads me into a question that just popped into my head. But Mike, what would your tips for actually growing a podcast is like? What are the what are the growth channels for podcasts? Like, how do you get found? It's actually more difficult um, because there isn't a central system. You know, there are many different platforms in which podcasts are found and consumed. iTunes is one of them, but it's not the biggest for some shows. It's biggest for others. It's got everything in it, 
right? So, you know, being in iTunes helps, but they don't have an algorithm like YouTube does. Mm -hmm. They don't surface things. It's all human curated or their featured pages. Growing a podcast in 2017 is very tricky from zero. When I started in 2010, having a show that had guests on it within my industry, within kind of like the technology industry, mainly focused on uh, on and around Apple, it was much easier to grow a show by having guests because nobody else was really doing it that much. And a lot of those people didn't have podcasts of their own. So it would be interesting to hear them. But in my industry, like in more technology focused podcasting now, it's really tricky because everybody has their own podcast. And one of the problems is that the people that a lot of the biggest shows are run by people that have existing audiences via another medium. Maybe they have a website, maybe they have a, a podcast that they've grown and they've started another one. You know, so it's really a um, it's an industry that is hard to come from nothing in. Not impossible, but it's harder. And one of the problems that I have with giving this advice now is the industry changed and I went along with it. So starting from zero today is. I guess, fortunately for me, not something that I do anymore because I have an existing audience. Right, for starting your show, there is a, a a modicum of people that will come along with it. But if you're starting from zero, I think really you start with that most annoying piece of advice, which is make good stuff and keep making it, right? Because that is all you can do, right? If you don't make good stuff and don't keep making it, no one's going to find you. Right, <laughs> you've got to make good stuff and put it on a schedule and release it frequently. You know, whatever your schedule is, but I think scheduling is really good because you become a part of somebody's day. Right, if people will know they can expect your show on a Tuesday, then every Tuesday morning they're going to expect your show for their commute. Um, but I think you've got to you've got to make good stuff. You've got to get good at it. If you want to have guests in, that's a great way to kind of find people and and maybe try and build your show up that way. You got to try and promote it, you know, promote it on Twitter and stuff like that. Try and build a grassroots feeling amongst the people that you have that they will share their show, your show, with their friends, and then you keep going that way. It's harder. It is definitely harder because there is no algorithm that will surface you, but it's not impossible. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have concrete advice. I guess we're mm. we're lucky in a way that you know we're not. In reality, we're not really starting from zero because we have that audience that will exactly. at, at least at least a bit convert over to this. And also, you know, a, a lot of the guests that we have will bring part of their fan base over. So that's going to make it uh, hopefully easier. But it is it, there is I mean, it's definitely I, I think that goes back to the whole, you know, the difference between having you know, 500,000 listens on a podcast and 500,000 views on YouTube, it's much harder to get those 500,000 listens. It's infinitely harder, yes. And the people who are listening are probably far more interested in the content. They're more invested in it. Yeah. And they're not just, they didn't just stumble upon they're us. They're not like, flybys. You, yeah. you don't really get flybys on podcasts so much. Unless there's, if, if it's a guest show, then you'll get people that will listen to that one episode, right? So you guys will find this. Like, you'll have, I expect, kind of quite varying uh, download numbers in your shows because people uh, are coming to listen to the person they're interested in. You'll pick up people along the way, and it's a great way to build an, an audience. But you'll pick up people. You know, some people will come to listen to Hank Green. Some people will come to listen to Destin. You know, they're gonna they're gonna come to listen to those shows. They may not listen to other ones, but who knows? But like with YouTube, you get people. They get this one video recommended to them, or a video goes viral. They watch it, but they don't necessarily subscribe. So they're never gonna see you again unless something else pops up. You know, mm-hmm. and that is that is a very different, um, it's very different to the way that podcasts work. That's fascinating, really. Like it, like much of YouTube is still a mystery to me. Like how things grow. Even like my first video went viral straight away which was bizarre wasn't expecting that but no one subscribed i probably got from a million views i probably got 500 subscribers mm-hmm. which is just bizarre like if i got a million views now i'd probably get fifty thousand subscribers or something like that I find that really interesting yeah like how these things actually how do you build an audience that stay with you i think that's that's the that's, i mean that's that's the big question the age-old question. The age-old mm. question. I guess we'll, I mean, 
This is this is our this is our attempt because <laughs> we're also kind of I, I guess this is kind of kind of our hobby in a sense more just like YouTube is your hobby now. Yeah, because it's like we we have it's no a side idea. project. Yeah, we have no idea how this is gonna. Uh, I mean, I think we're both at this stage where like we've kind of gotten not comfortable, but like YouTube is like working out. It's growing. We know that it's gonna, you know, more or less continue growing. So now that kind of first, you know, that climbing the mountain is kind of over because we've gotten into, you know, you're kind of in that mid tier club now for us. So now we're like, we want some other pursuit. Cause at least I'm personally like, I'm never bad. I, I'm always bad, not in the pursuit of something. So we're, I, we've, we've, Brian and I have both been talking about all these different side projects we want to do. And this is one of them. And we'll probably see one or two more in a couple months. And is that, I mean, that's right, Brian. Yeah. I mean, like it's always, I've always been this way. I've always been thinking about new things to create. And, and for me, that's it. Like, it's not like, making things difficult for me so myself or anything like that. It's just, I like creating new things and I like learning new, like new skills and learning, like having these new tools to work with. And I felt pod, a podcast would be like, I, I wanted to learn the skills of being able to talk on a podcast fluidly. I'm still getting there. I think I still stumble on my words quite a lot, but yeah, it's just, it's just fun creating things. It's growth in yourself rather than anything else. I'm also very, I'm also very like, uh, ooh, this is, this is hard to describe. I'm like large scale ADD in terms of, I, I don't like, I don't like doing one thing for too long of a time, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, so it's changing things up every, every year or so, you know? Yeah. It's like the curse of the creative person, right? You just can't stop creating and you want to keep making new things. And then these things are different to previous things. So you just keep making new things and new things and new things. And then you end up hosting nine podcasts. That's how that happens. <laughs> oh boy. Maybe, maybe we'll be hosting nine podcasts in five years' time. I, would, I wouldn't. Say, <laughs> never say never. This sounds like a nightmare. Oh, not, not, to, not to trash your job. <laughs> oh, it sucks. I'll tell you that I really like it because I, I, what I make podcasts about are the things that I enjoy. So I get to talk to my friends about the things that I like. I have a show about video games. I have a show about pens and paper. I have a show about Apple. I have a show about general technology. I have a show about how I work. Like these are all things that I have been passionate about. They're all hobbies and interests of mine. And then over time, I've been able to turn those hobbies and interests into a business. It's kind of a sweet setup. How do you have a podcast about pens and paper? Exactly, right? How? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What do you talk about? We talk about pens and paper. We talk about <laughs> new pens. We talk about what we think about stuff. We talk about... It's an industry that has news, you know, like like all industries do. Uh, we review products. It's possible. It is possible to review a pen via the medium of audio. And that is my longest show. We are approaching episode 250. Um, I have been making it since 2012. It's the show that I've stuck around with the longest. I've, I've shut down previous shows, started new shows. The Pen Addict is the show that I've been that stuck around for the longest, and it has a very dedicated audience of people. And we have over 10,000 people listen to that show, uh, okay. and it's wow. it's actually continuing to rise. It's the the power the power of a niche. Like it's fascinating. Do I, I don't know if I pronounced that word wrong or not. I hear people say niche. No, that, no, that's I say niche. Oh, that's completely. It's definitely niche. Don't don't worry, Brian. Yeah. Okay. Good. Don't worry. I worry about these things. I think niche is an Americanism. No, okay. I don't think so. But don't tell him I said that. <laughs> okay. Well, Mike, that was I think hugely interesting. Just getting that perspective on this medium that we're dipping into right now. So we really appreciate uh, you coming on and talking about all that. And, uh, I guess this is, this is a time to plug all your podcasts, but I particularly recommend your YouTube channel. I think it's hugely entertaining and needs more, needs some more exposure. I'm sure it will happen. I would love that. Well, you, you just need to upload more. That's my advice. You know, you just talk, you talked about schedule. I know, I know, I know that this is the problem I have is because I run this business and I am very busy. I, I don't upload as much as I think. Maybe some people will. 
I'm aiming right now to, to try and do a video a month. That's kind of like my, my baseline. Um, and then we'll, I'll see where I go from there. But that's kind of my kind of baseline at the moment. If you do want to check out my YouTube videos, uh, I am Mike Hurley on YouTube as M Y K E H U R L E Y. That's the name of my channel. Um, and my podcasts are all at uh, Relay FM, uh, which is relay.fm. We have a ton of shows there. Um, I expect that you'll probably be able to find something that tickles uh, your fancy. Some I'm on, some I'm not, but they're all great. Well, thank you again. And uh, mm-hmm. come back next time for an interview with a unnamed guest. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Mm-hmm.